here. Um, she's a group leader at the CRG of the epithelioscopic lab, and she she's a biochemist by training, and then she did the, the bioinformatics master at the UPF, and her uh, PhD at the IRB uh, with uh, Luis uh, Poplana, no Luis Rivas de Poplana. Uh, and then she moved to to uh, to MIT in Boston to do a postdoc with Manolis Kellis. Um, and uh, for, for two years, and she had two different uh, prestigious fellowships to, to the post of there, and moved then to Australia in Sydney at the Garber Institute, where she was a postdoc and then transitioned to a PI. Uh, and after a short time, she became a PI at the CRG. And her research is, is focused on understanding uh, different aspects of transcription, post transcriptional regulation. Uh, specifically the epic transcriptome, which is what she's going to talk about today, also ribosome specialization and RNA structure. So yeah, I'm super happy to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for having me here. And thank you, and I'm very sorry for, for starting so late, uh, but I hope that the presentation will make up for it. So uh, mm -hmm. bear with me. So yeah, as, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm now the <clears throat> group leader at the Center for Genomic Regulation since 2018. And uh, I'd like to briefly just explain, um, let me click here. Yeah, so what we, what we do in our lab. So our lab is the, can I maybe run into the Zoom or no? From the, well, it's gonna be there, right? Anyways, it doesn't matter. So my lab is the Epitranscriptomics and RNA Dynamics Lab. And basically, as the name says, um, what we study is RNA modifications, which are these chemical moieties that actually decorate RNA molecules. And for a long time, we just thought that they were just kind of structural uh, decorations. But after some research, we started realizing that they actually have very important functions and that actually they are reversible, meaning that if they can be put on and off. It's because they have a function that you want to tune. So maybe you want to now put the modification so that the RNA does some function, but maybe you want to have the RNA stop doing that function so you remove it. So the fact that that modifications are reversible really point towards the function of molecule of the RNA modifications beyond just being structural features. So in our lab, um, we're interested especially in RNA modifications and we study them using a diversity of technologies. Um, so we use uh, direct RNA nanopore sequencing, a lot of it, and also cDNA, so not just the direct RNA, also some Illumina and mass spectrometry. Uh, and the reason why we actually look into all these methods is to answer a variety of questions. So we're interested in understanding what is the role more at the molecular level. So for example, how does the presence of the modification affect the fate uh, of the RNA? So for example, does it cause to be degraded or even to change subcellular localization or other kind of features? More also at the developmental level as well. So especially in early embryogenesis, uh, transcriptional machinery is shut down. So all the regulation is post-transcriptional. And during these processes, actually modifications, we have seen that they play a very important role um, regulating these early developmental uh, stages. Also, in the case of human diseases, a lot of different modification enzymes are mutated, causing specific diseases. So we're really interested in understanding what is the function of these modifications and why their dysregulation leads to human diseases. And finally, we're even interested in the role that they play across generations. So what is their importance in actually transmitting information across generations? So today I will just briefly talk um, about this specific biological question. And I will then mainly go back to the technology and how we have had to develop the technology to actually answer this question. And I will then at the very end finish going back to the, to the biological question. So what is the question exactly? I, I just briefly introduced it, but a question that has fascinated me for a very long time, and actually it's not even my background of my PhD or postdoc, but I say that the privilege of being a PI is that you can really pursue the questions you want as long as you get the funding for it, right? Um, so I've always been fascinated by this question, which is that what we do in our lives actually affects the next generations. Um, but then we don't really understand how this information is transmitted across generations. So I don't know, when I was actually in, in undergrad, they would be explaining, you know, Darwin and Lamarck, and you would say, you know, the, the, the theory of how things happen and how they are passed to the next generation, right? And, and the truth is that even though one may think that actually Lamarck was wrong, in some aspects, he was not completely wrong. Um, but yeah, he was wrong, right? But, <laughs> but, but this is an example that sometimes reminds it reminds us to that, even though it is a different biological process, right? But the idea is that like, for example, if if actually uh, somebody has had a diet, 
this phenotype can be passed to the next generations. And you would say, how is that even possible, right? But this is true. And actually we have reproduced this in our own lab because I actually was even skeptical by just reading the papers. And the thing is like, if you feed high fat diet or normal diet to a given mouse, um, and then you do a glucose tolerance test. So basically you give glucose to the mouse and then you measure how, uh, how actually the glucose is um, degraded during a time. You will see that actually, you know, there's an altered glucose uh, curve in the case of the high fat diet mice, and then a normal degradation of the glucose in the normal diet, right? So there's like, they're, they're diabetic kind of, right? They have these altered uh, uh, curves, right? So this is no surprise, of course, like, you know, if you have a fat mouse, it has a bad, you know, degradation of sugar in the blood. But the thing is that if now you look into the offspring of these mice and the mice of the offspring are only fed with normal diet, you can still see significant differences between the curves in the offspring, even though in their lives, they have always been fed with this normal diet, meaning that there's something of what the parental did in their lives that is passed to the offspring. And not only that, but we actually look into a parental model, meaning that that information is in sperm and whatever the sperm contributes has enough information to pass this across generations. It cannot be behavioral, sorry. Behavioral, behavior, only behavior, because the mother is taking care of the calf. But the contribution is only the, par the, the, the sperm, right? It's only the sperm. Like the par once you breed the female with the male, the, the female is put apart. I, and they're separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't so, see the mom eating more. No, the mom is actually feed with no fed with normal diet. Uh, the mom is fed with normal diet. So this is a parental model, right? And the only contribution that the male does is when you put them actually to right. breed. Okay. And then the male is removed. And then the mom, which is actually uh, fed with normal diet, has, right. the, has the pups and then they are weaned. And then you would treat them equally, no matter how they were coming from. Mm -hmm. So this question has actually been mm, brushed for a long time. And, and actually, uh, first people looked into DNA methylation, but then they really couldn't see any differences in the, in the mice or in the sperm. And, and then actually two back-to-back -back papers published um, now already a few years ago showed that um, there were altered tRNA-derived fragments in the sperm RNA populations, suggesting that these could be the molecular carriers that actually are doing the information, are passing the information across generations. Um, but then somehow the, the question still stands, right? Like how does high fat diet get converted into alternative derived fragments in, in the sperm? And also could there be other contributors than the alternative derived fragments, which is what we also think. But for this first question, what we actually think that may be playing an important role is RNA modifications, because as we have discussed, RNA modifications can affect the fate and function of the molecules. And actually in the case of tRNAs, tRNA-derived fragments come from tRNAs, and we believe that if you change the modification patterns, um, actually you could cause uh, altered tRNA-derived fragments. So a model would be that basically, so, so the idea that like modifications can affect the, the, the stability of the, of the molecules, and basically at, upon specific environmental uh, metabolites, you would put certain modifications that lead to the formation of certain fragments. But then the question still stands, like which RNA modifications would be important, right? I mean, this is an hypothesis, but then how do you start studying which modifications you think could be important for this question? Well, uh, the thing is that the epitranscriptome, which is the term that we use to collectively refer to, um, to all the modifications that exist, um, comes in more than 170 different flavors. And actually here, uh, some years ago, we did this kind of study where we show, um, we, we kind of colored those modifications that are found in and associated to human diseases, colored in red. And then we circle those for which we have a method to study them. So my point is, if, if you have a biological question, how do you choose which modification you think is important for your biological question of interest, right? Maybe you have heard a lot about M6A modifications and you can think, okay, it is true that they are the most abundant mRNA modifications, but are they really the most relevant ones? Um, you know, the fact that they are the most abundant in protein, protein uh, exclusively, not in other uh, RNA types. Uh, does that make them the most important ones? Or is it just that we have an antibody selective to the modification and that's why we have studied it so much? Because the truth is that so far, um, our way to understand modifications transcriptome wide relies on either of these two methods. So one is antibody based. Uh, so you need a selective antibody 
that will bind the modification of interest and it doesn't have to cross react with other modifications so similar to chip seek if you're maybe more familiar with it um and then you will do some immunoprecipitation to enrich for it and then when you do your next generation sequencing library you will see an accumulation of reads uh, in the form of a peak now you can make it a bit more sophisticated and get single nucleotide resolution mm -hmm. but the point is you need a selective antibody which is not so straightforward to obtain you have a different variety of methods that instead of an antibody, they rely on chemical. So what you have here is a chemical that selectively reacts with your modification of interest, and then you can kind of couple it to some reverse transcription that will cause a drop off, for example, of the reverse transcriptase because it is too bulky. And then when you kind of look at the accumulation of your reads, you can then say, OK, the modification was here because all my reads drop at this position precisely. So by looking at your accumulation of uh, reverse transcription stops, you can actually know where the modifications were because the chemical didn't allow the reverse transcription to go through it. But so in either of both of the cases, you still need a chemical or an antibody. And that's why the circles here are so few amongst all the modifications that in principle we could be interested in. So how to overcome this problem? So that's where we got interested in nanopore sequencing because nanopore sequencing actually allows you to sequence native RNA molecules, including their modifications. And therefore in principle, you can see any given RNA modification in theory. So how does this work for those that maybe are not so familiar? Uh, nanopore sequencing is a third generation sequencing type of technology, meaning that it's a long read sequencing uh, technology. And that what you sequence is the RNA or DNA molecule. And the way that it works is that as the RNA or DNA molecule goes through the nanopore, that it is actually um, passed at a constant speed thanks to the helicase that is actually bound to the, to the RNA or DNA during the library preparation. It passes at a constant speed and there's actually the nanopores are embedded in this membrane. The membrane is actually coupled to an emitter, so you can actually measure the disruptions in the current intensity that are caused as the molecule advances through the nanopore. So basically here you can see that uh, as the molecule advances through the nanopore, there is a change in the current intensity. And then using specific machine learning algorithms in the early times, they were hidden Markov models and nowadays they're more like uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, you can then convert the signal intensities into the corresponding letters. If you use DNA, it will be ACGT. If you have RNA, the model is trained to predict ACGU. And there you go. <laughs> so in principle, um, what are the advantages? Well, in principle, you can capture all possible RNA modifications. You don't need custom protocols uh, for each modification as before. You don't need to find this antibody. And this is important because you don't need to then make choices uh, beforehand of what you think is important or what will be the answer of which modification is important for your biological question. Um, in principle, it is quantitative because you actually do this at each individual read separately. So, so you, you will say, okay, I measure 10 reads that have the modification and 10 that don't have it. So then I know that it's 50% modified and I didn't do any PCR that could possibly bias, uh, you know, my, my preferential amplification or anything like that. Uh, not only that, but because you have actually long reads, you can now associate which modification is present in which isoform and this is very important because as we know like the transcriptome is very diverse there's different isoforms and they're not all equally modified necessarily so in the same way that that you know you have some um some splicing splice variants that are abundant in one tissue or another modifications may not be equally placed across the different isoforms and that could actually be one of the main reasons why the different isoforms have different functions <laughs> or different half-lives or why they are modified differently in terms of their poly A tail lengths or stability and so on and so forth. Another thing that is actually quite nice is actually that you can also capture the poly A tail length. We've done some research about this. I won't talk much about it today, but, but it is also nice because then you can study how modifications and uh, poly A uh, is actually coupled one to the other. So, you know, the UC modifications in those that are, have shorter or longer poly A's, what is the dynamics between these two machineries? And finally, you have really single molecule resolution in principle, right? So these are some key advantages of nanopore sequencing that really made us choose that uh, this kind of uh, technology to go to investigate RNA modifications. But of course, uh, and, and then like the, the last message that I always also wanted to point here before moving on is that um, sometimes we have to rethink what we think we know about things, right? So Often we call, you know, what we know about Illumina RNA-seq, but in my opinion, it's not RNA-seq, it's cDNA-seq. So all what we know about the transcriptome using NGS really is based on what you can reverse transcribe. 
So if you cannot even reverse transcribe it, you're not even seeing it. And modifications, as we know, actually are a big cause of not being able to reverse transcribe certain molecules. So I, this is just to consider that, you know, all of what we have been looking to in many cases is an indirect measurement of RNA and not actually the native RNA molecules. But of course, um, you know, stories are not always pretty. And, you know, like, I mean, I put like all the advantages, but there's actually, of course, some very important major drawbacks, right, of any technology. And in my opinion, there's four major challenges that um, needed to be addressed for us uh, to use it for specific questions. So first of all is um, there's no base color for RNA modifications. So what does this mean? I said that the theory is that you can detect the modifications, but if you kind of rewind, what I was saying is that the, the here the, the current intensity is converted into the nucleotide sequence and it predicts ACGU. So how will you actually predict the modification? In principle, what you need is a model that will predict not just ACGU, but actually also the modification, right? So for example, ACGU M6A or whatever it, the modification is. So even though the theory is that it can detect the modifications, if you go to the website, there's no model for predicting modifications in RNA, right? So that makes your life a bit more complicated. Um, the second is that actually you need relatively large input requirements. And this partly makes sense because you're sequencing native RNA, right? So there's no amplification step. So of course you can only sequence as much as you put into the flow cell, but then, um, it is true that it can be probably optimized, but in any case, um, this is also a limitation that needs to be taken into account. The third limitation is that at least the, the commercial protocols are limited to only polyethylated transcripts. So if you're interested in other populations, you need to come with some solution to solve this problem. And finally, even though that is not like that clearly stated in the, you know, by Nanopore, the truth is that when you look at your distribution of your reads, perhaps because it was originally designed as a um, long read sequencing technology, um, you only capture things that are in general like over 200 base pairs in a reliable manner. So if you're interested in things that are shorter than that, you may have to come up with a, some type of solution. And in our case, actually, this is one of the scenarios that we care about. Because here, for example, if you look into, this is a bionalyzer profile of hex cells, and here you would see a total RNA profile, right? So here, this is the marker, and here you would have the peak of the 18S and the 28S, typical of total RNA with a nice RIN of 9.0, right? So here, this would be a normal profile uh, for, for total RNA for a somatic cell. But if you look at the RIN and sperm, it looks like if you, you messed up your extraction, but actually you didn't. The sperm RNA population really looked like this. It looks like degraded <laughs> RNA. We can argue why it is this case, but that's how it is. So in any case, if you want to use nanopore for uh, sperm populations, you will need to solve the issue of sequencing small RNAs. So, okay, let's go challenge by challenge, right? So RNA modification, so how can, can we actually detect them using nanopore sequencing? Okay, so the theory is that in principle, um, if you would have a modification at the positions where you would have the modification, you should have a shift in the current intensity at those positions, right? So by comparing you know, one read versus another, those positions that have a shift in the current intensity should correspond to positions that are actually modified, right? So in this case, this is an M1G and this is another M1G position, right? Um, and this in the theory looks very nice and that's, uh, you know, it, it should work well. And that's what we were discussing that should be possible already back in 2017. But when we were trying to do it, we came with an interesting bioinformatic problem, which was that in order to do this, you first need to solve this other problem, which is the risk wiggling problem. And basically the thing is that as anything in biology, uh, biology is not perfect. So the, the library uses a helicase to actually um, pass the molecule at a constant speed. But this constant speed is not constant. It has an average constant speed, but it is imperfect as anything. So the sequence and the way it is kind of protruded is kind of like an accordion. Some regions are faster, some regions are a bit shorter. So you first need to do this exercise of matching which region matches with what, and that is not simple. And this process actually relies on the base call to guide the decisions actually, otherwise it would be a mess. And in the very early times, back in 2017, the base calling accuracy was super low uh, for RNA, actually. And therefore, when you use the base calls to guide this, it was a disaster. So back then, we were trying that, and it wasn't working. So we kind of decided to come to a different solution. So what we realized is that um, 
modifications actually appear somehow like this. So they look like base calling errors, like SNPs, if you want to say it, or um, like basically like systematic errors that appear in your tracks. If you think about the reason of this, it's because if you are a model and you only are trained to predict four letters. So if you find something like in this case, a pseudouridin, well, so the urine is going to look somewhere between two letters, for example, right? So the model is kind of dumb and basically it has a distribution. And then it says like, okay, in some cases it kind of looks more like this one. And in some cases it looks more like this one. So here, what you're benefiting from is the fact that like your model is not trained to see this. So then it kind of puts a bit of both that it looks like in some cases. So, so what we realize is that this kind of uh, error pattern, we could exploit it to predict modifications. So we developed this uh, code that we called Epinano. And we actually trained it using um, a modified and modified sequences. In this case, they were synthetic sequences that comprise all possible fibers. The reason for this is because to make nanopore sequencing more fun, the signal is always dependent not only on the, on the signal of the base, but also of the surrounding sequence context. <clears throat> so the signal intensity depends on a given fibmer or sixmer or more, that's arguable, but let's say that fibmer at least, because that's what is comprised in the nanopore at a, given, at a given time. So what we kind of did is we collected intensity signal and also base calling data. We fed that to a model and basically we saw that we could more or less classify well uh, whether a kamer had or didn't have uh, a modification. And so does it work for other modifications? Our proof of concept was with M6A but then we kind of shifted to other cases. And what we saw is that this was happening with many different modifications. So it was not just M6A uh, as a chance. I mean, I already kind of gave a spoiler because I showed you first the pseudouridin, so you already knew the answer, right? But first we actually tried it on M6A and then we moved to other modifications, right? And what we actually saw here is that, you know, pseudouridin also causes uh, this kind of error. Uh, two primal methylations of different types also cause the error. And what we also included here is knockout strains that lack specific snow RNAs. For those that maybe are not so familiar with this, snow RNAs are what guide uh, to, you know, like the different modifications in ribosomal RNA. So these are actually ribosomal RNA um, sequencing runs. And what we're showing here, like here, there's a wild type strain and then like three different knockout strains. And this one, in this case, for example, SN. 62 is the snRNA responsible for this modification. So what this proves is that it's not just that by coincidence, there's an error in the region that has the modification, but actually that this signature here is really caused by the presence of modification because when I remove this no RNA that puts the modification, the signal is lost. And you can see that this happens consistently in the different um, modifications, right? So this is a very clean system to really demonstrate that the error patterns that you're seeing are really driven by the modification that you actually are looking into. And not only that, but actually I think that it's very interesting to see that if we look now at a given strain and compare the errors of the knockout versus the wild type, basically everything is in the diagonal, meaning that it's the same in the wild type and the knockout. And the things that are really outside of the diagonal are the known modified sites that are put by this SNRNA. So for example, in the case of SNR3, there's three positions that are known to be placed. In the case of SN61, it's, it's one. And then these positions here are actually the neighboring positions. As I was saying, the five mer that sometimes is also affected the signal. And the same here, actually, the positions in blue are the five mer. So this here, it's more spread because as you can see, the signal is actually spread around the position, right? Um, so, okay, that was actually good news. We can detect different modifications. So if we can, can we actually apply this to study modification dynamics? So, okay, we decided to look into heat stress and yeast and, and looked into normal versus uh, stressed cells. The reason why we chose that is because there was also a very published Illumina data uh, detecting uh, some known, um, so the uridine sensitive sites upon heat stress. So what you can see here is that some previously reported sites, we detect as well that upon heat shock, they appear, right, as a modification. And then here we also detect some that were not reported by the previous methods. Um, interestingly, many of them, you would see that actually they were present already in the wild type, right? It's just that, so in some cases it's presence absence, but in some cases they are present in the wild type strain. It's just that they increase in the stoichiometry. You can see that the error increases upon the heat stress, meaning that most likely the previous methods struggled at detecting uh, quantitative differences rather than just presence absence. And so, okay, these were modifications present in some small non-coding RNAs. 
we could also see some examples here in mRNAs, but I have to say we didn't see changes in ribosomal RNAs. And we actually tested a variety um, of um, stresses. So at this point, we were actually quite surprised because that's not what literature said, um, but that's a different question. So even though you know oxidative stress had been reported to cause modification changes, we were not able to reproduce that. Um, so then we ask, okay, is it that ribosomal RNAs are never dynamically uh, modified? And we realize that that's not the case. It's just that at least under that condition, it's not, but under some other conditions, ribosomal RNA modifications can be dynamically regulated as well. And for this, we actually looked into E. coli ribosomal RNA and we subjected the, the cells to specific antibiotic uh, treatments. Um, and I would like to say that the antibiotics actually bind the ribosome. So what, what this means is that the cell kind of defends itself um, by, by actually tuning the modification so that the binding of the, of the antibiotic will, will actually change. So if you wanna bear with me for a second, what you can see here is like, we looked here, if, if look at this, these tracks here are actually the 16S ribosomal RNA. And here what we are looking is how the modification score, so we're kind of doing a screening throughout the whole transcript, is gonna be changing along the 16S ribosomal RNA. So what we can see is that upon streptomycin treatment, for example, and in a highly replicable manner, uh, there's these positions here and highlighted in red, which actually significantly change upon the antibiotic treatment, right? And, and, and upon casugamycin treatment, actually, it's a different subset of uh, regions containing modifications that is significantly changing. But then when we look at the 23S ribosomal RNA in, in E. coli, nothing is changing really in, in neither of the two. So we said, okay, let's put this now into 3D structure. So when we do it into the 3D structure, what we see is that upon streptomycin here, the region that is actually changing is where the, where the streptomycin is binding. Sorry, here in this picture, I didn't include the streptomycin molecule, so you will have to believe me. Um, but basically these positions here are surrounding them where, where streptomycin is binding, where, whereas, these residues here are actually surrounding where casugamycin is binding. So somehow the cells can tune their ribosomal RNA modifications to respond to environmental stress. And well, the question to me is actually how uh, these new ribosomal variants, if you wanna call it, are generated because in principle, for what we know, you know, ribosomes are pretty much fully modified in most of the positions as part of the maturation stages. So then, does this mean that there's the methylases that we don't know about? Or does this mean that um, there's actually ways to escape the maturation process and generate incompletely modified uh, ribosomal RNAs? So that's a secondary question that we will still need to answer. But what is clear from this is that ribosomal RNA modifications can also be dynamically regulated upon environmental exposures. Okay, so we can now detect and study dynamics, but then can we really go quantitative, right? So, I mean, in principle, I always said, yes, this is a single read technology, but then is it really a quantitative technology or not? So <clears throat> uh, to this, we have to go back to our friend, the risk quickling problem and, and see if we can kind of solve it. So the good thing is that we took this years later, later and then the accuracy of the base calling algorithm had actually improved significantly. So we were now able to solve this problem much more accurately. So if now we translate this into real data, uh, you can now see that we can align the reads um, basically in a, in a good way, and we can even see population. So now using these uh, knockout strains that I was describing before, we can see, for example, so here we have four knockout strains, and you can see that, for example, in purple are all those reads that are fully modified. So they correspond to the wild type strain, or there's no or the other knockout that are actually wild type to those positions. And then you see a green population here that is standing out, meaning, and, and this is the position that is actually placed by this no RNA. So what we know is that these are unmodified reads, whereas everything else is modified. So you can see clearly that there's two different populations. And if you do the same strains for a different control site, there's actually no difference. They are just completely overlapping, meaning that here, all the sites are fully modified. And here you can have a population of unmodified and modified. So by doing this, we kind of said, okay, if we can really bin reads based on two populations always, we can then predict how many are modified and unmodified. So of course we use this for benchmarking, but then you can predict it for other sites. So 
you can now start making a prediction of, okay, how many reads are belonging to one population or the other? How many are modified or unmodified? And you can see that the predictions basically are that in the knockout strain, we don't have any modified reads. And then in the wild type strains, we have for the three other strains, they are actually highly modified, meaning that we can now finally, you know, be quantitative and count how many reads are modified and unmodified for a given site. So this is just to mention that, um, so how was the model trained, right? Um, so basically this is just to mention that at least in our experience for these specific cases, we use different algorithms, KNNs, K-means, random forest or whatever. But what we found is that the algorithm choice itself wasn't making that much of a difference. I mean, it does, but it's not the main important thing here. It is the features that you feed to the algorithm what actually made the difference of being quantitative or not. So for example, if we only use signal intensity, which would be the logic of what you should use, we always realize that we were underestimating the stoichiometry, meaning that there's additional features that need to be fed into the model to really capture um, all the information that contains the fact of whether a read is modified or not. So, okay. So very nice, we can detect modifications and we can quantify them, but still what I'm always, talking about is, okay, we can bend the, modifi the modification rate, right? We're still not solving the base problem, which is base calling them, right? <clears throat> so for some time, we were trying to solve this problem. And because the, the, the thing is, we have to go to the very, very beginning, right? Which is how these, these machine learning algorithms that will predict letters, what we need is to give it a different model in a way that instead of predicting ACGU, it will predict, for example, ACGU and M6A, right? But for this, you need to train a model. So after a lot of um, issues and problems, we finally were able to train new models that will include modifications. And finally, at the beginning, they were a disaster, but then finally we got some <clears throat> that we are actually pretty happy with. So this is just an example of how the data looks when you base call uh, nanopore reads using our trained model that predicts five letters instead of four. So what you can see here is um, unmodified synthetic sequences that are without the modification or with the modification. And I mean, you can clearly see already, you can guess where the modification is, right? So it is, so for those that maybe are not that familiar with this layout, so this is IGV tracks. Uh, and basically each line here is gonna be an independent read, right? So here you see the aggregated coverage, and then you see each individual read. And then each the base of each individual read is colored by what we call the modification probability. This is a score that the model, the base calling model that we have trained, is giving to each base at each position. So basically, you know, like if, it, if it's this kind of a faint color, it means that the algorithm is not predicting it as modified. Whereas if it has this very bright color, the algorithm is predicting it as modified. So in this way, you can really visually see quickly which positions are modified and in which read, right? And you can see that it, overall, it predicts it to be highly modified. So we said, okay, it works in vitro. How about in vivo, right? So, oops, sorry. So in vivo, we decided to look into um, human data that it was um, wild type or knockout to methyl three. Methyl three is the enzyme that puts M6A modifications in human mRNA. So what we see is that, for example, again, the position here, uh, that is in a known motif uh, of, um, of human, it actually puts the modifications at high stoichiometry. And then in the knockout, you still see some faint background. And we can argue if this is our false positive rate or that the knockout actually was not complete because now there's some discussions on some of the knockouts uh, that have been generated. Um, but in any case, if you look at the statistics globally, you can see that in general, what we find is that in the wild type strains, um, the, uh, the median modification frequency in the genome is around 10%, uh, which is in agreement with other estimations that other people have done previously. And when you look into the knockout population, this is the distribution of the density of, of the modification frequency, you can see a huge shift towards the left, meaning that actually there's a massive decrease in the modification with a median stoichiometry of something around 1%, which is probably our false positive rate. So overall, we were quite happy because we think that now this really allows you to start predicting M6A modifications de novo without any prior knowledge, without even having a background model, because usually until now, all what I have been explaining until here, you always need pairwise conditions. You needed 
a condition and a control. And then you look at the differences, right? But with this, you can then suddenly, with a sample that you have no knowledge about, you can de novo predict which modifications are and whether these two, for example, patients are actually differentially modified, right, at this specific position. So this really opens a different avenue of how we study modifications de novo. Okay, and this is just to illustrate like an Zoom example, right? Some random examples. So this is just a gene with the different coverage, with the different isoforms. You can see nice splicing with some differences in the splicing variant, right? And what you can see is like, okay, now you can say, okay, look at these reads here that have this modification, right? These ones are, you know, in general in the isoform that is mainly spliced out, whereas the other one is actually mainly in the one that is non-spliced. So you can now really start doing what we were discussing, which is isoform specific M6A modification patterns. Okay, and then just this is just to show that actually, if you kind of look into the features of these modifications that we're predicting, they really match the previous literature. So we capture the, the DRACH motive that is described for M6A, and also the majority of the modifications that we are predicting, you know, fall into the stop colon area and three prime UTR in agreement with um with the previous literature using NGS based technologies. Okay. Um, so I talk a lot about multiplication because that was the, a lot of what we do and I wanted to share what we have done so far, but I would like to also give a bit of um, touches on other aspects also that we've been working related to using nanopore. Um, and one of them is on starting using less material, right? So um, if you want to look into, for example, certain patient derived samples, always, you know, like input amounts is really a limitation, right? So can you start with less material? Well, this is one of the questions we try to address. And for that, what we decided to say is like, okay, there's two approaches for this problem. One of them is to say, okay, instead of, uh, I mean, we can improve the library prep to start with less molecules, or we can multiplex it. Because if you actually look into the commercial library uh, that is offered by Nanopore, there's no multiplexing option, right? So if coverage is not a limitation for you, if you multiplex several samples, then you can now put, for example, four samples that in total give you the 500 nanograms, meaning that then you only need 100 nanograms per sample. Then you can pull it to your flow cell and then you can sequence it. So what we did here briefly is that we ligated um, a different DNA adapter at the end in the first step. So we modified the library. Um, and then using specific um, machine learning algorithms, we converted that into the base code. Um, I'd like to know maybe for those and there are more by from you say, why do you even do all this weird pipeline for the multiplexing your reads, right? And the thing is that you have to consider that when you sequence these reads, you are sequencing RNA under an RNA-based calling model. And this first ligation step here, this adapter that you ligate here to the very end, is actually DNA. And that's how the library is done. It's the first step of your library preparation in direct RNA is an RNA DNA ligation. So you can actually clearly see that the current intensity of this region, which is the adapter, is actually much lower than the rest of the read because DNA typically has a lower average current intensity than RNA, right? So this region here is DNA and your base calling algorithm cannot base call it because it doesn't know how to read DNA. And also this region that is so close to the very end is very noisy. So the thing is, okay, we cannot you know, base call into which letters it is. So how can we then classify what these regions are. So what we kind of came up with is that, I mean, at the beginning, one option would have been this risk quickling thing that I was saying, and then like try to figure out, but then that wasn't really working again. So what we kind of figured out is that we convert this into an image, even though there will be some errors in the image conversion, the algorithms for classifying images and using two DCNNs are actually very, very powerful. So it, the, the error that they will lead to is very low because they are quite robust to identifying the patterns. So using 2D CNNs actually, uh, which is what this software um, is actually doing, we could um, actually the multiplex with high accuracy and high recovery, allowing us to really decrease the input sample. And now we have been pushing this uh, forward even further. And we're now actually up to 96 barcodes uh, with the idea to really go into exploring the diversity at a um, at much lower uh, level. So, Okay, um, the third challenge that I was saying is um, 
that we can actually sequence non-poly A material, right? And of course, one quick and dirty solution that you can do to your plumbing is to poly A your sample, and then you will be able to capture everything, right? But if you're actually interested in poly A tail lengths, then that's not a very smart solution. So we said like, okay, can we sequence non-poly A material and still capture uh, the poly A tail length? So this is a bit what we went for. So the idea is that if you look into the commercial kits here, direct RNA and even direct cDNA, and then there will be the PCR version, but it's just amplifying this, right? Um, in this case, both of them rely on an adapter that has an oligo DT at its end, right? So in, it doesn't, in one case, it's not exactly the same way. One anneals at, you know, at this border, the other one anneals at the other border. But the idea is that here you will keep the poly tail length, here you won't even keep it, to be fair. But in neither of the cases, you can capture poly A minus because you rely on this oligo DT. So then you would say, okay, don't, don't use oligo DT. True, but then how do you initiate the reverse transcription, right? So what we came up with is with an option that actually uses an N overhang. So if you use an N overhang, then you can initiate the reverse transcription using template switching, and then you actually don't need an oligo DT overhang. And when you do this, then you still can capture poly A tail length and the poly A minus RNAs. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail with this, but the here, what I'm showing is that you still keep the poly A tail length information very well by doing this approach, because here I'm just showing that um, it is known that during the maternal to zygotic transition in zebrafish, the poly A tail length increases. So what you can see is that for, from two to four to six hours, we see the shift in the distribution of poly A tail length, really showing that using this var variation of the library, we are able to keep the, the poly A tail length information. And secondly, and more interestingly for us, is that we can keep the tail uh, content dynamics. So something that is quite interesting to me is that not, not all poly A tails are just uh, made of poly A, of, of adenine. Actually, what you know, there's more and more literature suggesting that uh, poly A tails can have additional modifications like polyuridylations or even internal modifications, and that this composition is actually very important to determine the fate and function of the, of the polyadenylated RNA. So not only the length is important, but also the composition of the tail. So if you're able to look into this, uh, you are able to see a whole new variety of information. And what we, what we show here is actually that, for example, in two hours post-fertilization in the zebrafish model again, like all the tails in general, so here we subdivide the tails into different um, populations, right? So everything is all A, so all the composition is A, right? Actually that it has termination, so it's all A's, but then it has some terminal modifications, right? So terminal G, terminal U, terminal C, or that it has internal modifications, right? And what you can see is that the behavior of these populations changes during the development. So for example, these terminal U populations really tend to be very short. So this means that, you know, probably the terminal uridylation is causing them to be degraded, for example, right? Because, and that's why, you know, they are not actually being lengthened and basically they will probably be disappearing. And, and they, they really have different behaviors. So in general, there's an increase in the tail length, but this doesn't happen in the case of polyuridylated uh, tails, right? So my point here is this is like in the, the case of ma maternal to zygotic transition in zebrafish is a more ex a studied example, um, but there's many different scenarios in which we really don't understand what is the, the, um, the role that tail heterogeneity is playing in regulating the fate of mRNAs. And I think that this really opens uh, a lot of possibilities to study these dynamics of mRNAs based on the tail uh, composition. So, okay, um, so the fourth and last challenge that I wanted to discuss here today is a small RNA sequencing, right? And actually my PhD um, and with this, it was a, a lot related to tRNA. So uh, like they always say like, what is your favorite RNA molecule, right? So if I had to answer this is, uh, it's tRNAs, right? Um, for many different reasons. I think for the canonical role that they hold um, because their ability to really decide you know, how you translate in, in the, the genetic code. Um, because of their other non-canonical functions. And I mean, there's many different things that I think are super interesting about tRNAs. But um, sequencing tRNAs, even though we, I really wanted to look into this from the very beginning, um, <clears throat> is not as simple as it sounds. So um, our very first sequencing runs done by Morgan, who was a PhD student in the lab, were a complete disaster. So here you can see how direct RNA sequencing looks usually, for example, for ribosomal RNAs or mRNAs, right? Like you see in general, they are, I mean, the algorithms improve. So, you know, the base calling is not that bad. 
maybe this could be a pseudo year demodification, for example, right? Um, but in any case, it looks reasonably good. Some insertions and deletions, typical of nanopore long reads and so on, right? But then when you look at the tier it was a complete disaster. It looked like you don't even know if it's mapping properly. And it has even a super, super low thrust um, coverage, right? And we didn't know what was going on. It took us a lot of work, both in changing the library as well as changing the algorithms to analyze it. And finally, we were able to, um, so Morgan teamed up also with Leszek, who's a bioinformatician in the lab. And, and, and basically we were able to, 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 to get something that really starts looking like tRNAs. So these are synthetic tRNAs, which are supposedly unmodified. And you can see that in general, you don't see many modifications. You still see some, which are probably background errors, right? Um, but it looks reasonable now. Um, and then when you look into biological tRNA, you do see some errors, right? Because they are heavily modified, like 30% of the positions in tRNAs on average are actually modified. And, and, and what you can see that in general, the modification size really more or less coincide with the modified size, right? So the errors look like modifications here. So, okay, we said, can we study modification dynamics really in tRNAs or no? So here we compared, for example, the wild type and the knockout strain. And in this case, we used a push for knockout strain, which is putting the modification so the uridine at position 55, which is the one I'm highlighting here. So what you can see is that also in tRNAs, as shown before, what we can do is study modification dynamics. So you can actually, even though it kind of looks like, a, let's say, a messy with a lot of errors, actually, these errors really are the modifications of interest. So for example, you can here see that this position was pseudouridine because when you remove the enzyme that puts this modification, now this modification is gone, right? which really proves the point that what we're capturing here is real modifications, not mismapped stuff that is really not mapping properly, and that we can study modification dynamics. So, okay, if we kind of look into this in an aggregated mode, so if now we kind of like before I was showing just one tRNA, right? And all the individual rates mapping for each tRNA, right? So now let's just look at this kind of, um, at, at, at this track, and let's compare knockout versus wild type, right? So let's subtract this coverage track minus this. What I would expect is to see the differences in errors between one and the other, right? So what I would expect is that if, and now I do this for all the tRNAs, right? And I aggregate it. So what we can see is that in the push for knockout for all the tRNAs, all of them actually, when I compare push for to wild type, have the modification, right? Because I see a consistent perfect line in this position, meaning that really all of the tRNAs are actually modified by this enzyme, which really makes like figuring this out in the early years would, would have been a lot of biochemical work testing individual tRNA one by one. And not only that, but then you can start doing into other pus knockout strain, right? So how do other enzymes start looking into? So well, if now I remove pus one, I see a different picture. I actually see that pus one uh, is actually missing only, you know, in, in, certain, in some specific positions, which are reported in the literature, a specific positions are losing the pseudouridine. And also, in the case of POS7, it's reported to put this modification here, only in some tRNAs. Again, that's what I'm, what I'm really seeing, right? So you can really start studying modification dynamics in a very precise manner for all the tRNAs in a, in a simple and comprehensive way. And not only that, but you can start also seeing codependencies of uh, modifications in the same tRNA. So if you look at this, like this kind of looked a bit dirty, right? You had this position, then you had this kind of blur here a bit. It was like, what, 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 is this just dirtiness or is this actually real? So when there's another modification at this position, right? But only in some tRNAs. So what did we decided is to, so okay, with this position, we said this position is the position where M1A is typically found. So what if we bin our reads into those tRNAs that have M1A and those that don't have M1A actually at position 58? And what you can see is that actually those that don't have M1A really had a clean signal. It's only those that have M1A that had this kind of blur, which really means that when you remove one modification, the other one is also lost, meaning that the enzyme that was putting this other modification requires pseudouridine to actually put it. So it means that you can now not only look at where modifications are, but study also the interdependencies and codependencies of different modifications in the same reads. Okay, so how can we use all this actually for any specific purpose? Really like, very nice. Now you can map modifications in tRNAs. Why did you even want to do this to start all this effort, right? Well, I kind of had this in mind from, for a long time, right? And the reason is that there's been a lot of different publications actually kind of stating the importance of tRNAs 
in cancer, for example, right? So in general, it is it has been shown that you know that you have different tRNA populations in you know metastasis versus non-metastasis or cancer versus non-cancer, and you know there's this this regulation of uh, tRNAs, and people argue that uh, you know they are important because then you have preferential translation of certain codons. Uh, you know, in the other scenario, you preferentially translate a different subset of codons leading to, you know, enhanced invasion and metastasis or not, basically, right? So this is the biological explanation of why they are dysregulated. But but the point is that they are dysregulated, right? And this has been shown even by different uh, NGS approaches that also were sequencing tRNAs. The thing is, like, to generate this data, it takes a lot of effort because NGS-based libraries for tRNA are actually quite complex to make. But different papers were also seeing this kind of thing. Also, we're comparing normal versus cancer, right? So you can see that in normal cells, there's basically, you know, this a, a given distribution of uh, tRNA abundances. And upon cancer, either in breast or in lymphoma, in these two different examples from two different papers, you can see that there's a dysregulation of certain tRNAs, right? So certain tRNAs appear to be upregulated. And in the breast cancer, there's other subsets of tRNAs that seem to be upregulated, right? So the question is, okay, the biological explanation in, of of you know, like of what, why the cells have this is something that is very interesting. But a different approach that one can think is, if this is the case, you maybe have a very interesting biological marker to actually do cancer diagnosis and prognosis. And not only that, but if you actually have not only the dimension of abundances but also the modifications, you can probably fine tune your predictions much better than using NGS-based technologies. So this is what we decided to start looking into. So first we started looking into um, cell lines. So this is our breast cancer cell lines. And what we started looking into is, okay, um, can, do we also see using nanopore this regulation of tRNA abundances when we compare, for example, MCF10 to a normal, normal, you can always argue about how normal they are, but to a normal background, or you know, if you have other, you know, let's say more cancerous um, cell lines um, relative to the normal, um, do we see changes in tRNA abundances? And this is basically recapitulating more or less what we were seeing also with Illumina, right? So that basically upon specific uh, cancer, we see this regulation uh, of specific tRNA abundances. And not only that, but we also see specific regulations in tRNA modifications. So this means that actually you now have, you know, a lot of uh, dimensionality in your data because you have the abundances and the modifications at individual tRNA acceptors to really start training models and making some predictions on whether, you know, a sample is actually cancerous or metastatic and so on and so forth. Um, so right now what is ongoing work is to build a model that will combine both in an efficient way and really then make predictions to, to you know, um, apply it in the future for clinical purposes. And why do I think that Nanopore has this nice opportunity? And I mean, you could sequence tRNAs already, uh, you know, with Illumina. Well, you could, but then like, you know, the library preparation is complex. The sequencing typically take days. The data analysis is actually also quite complex. It would take very long time, right? But then with nanopore sequencing, really, this is very short and simple. And right now, I mean, I'm running here a week, but we can actually get it done in two days already. Um, and then like the future in progress, which was what I'm saying, like I was already in, already in going, is that in principle with three hours of library preparation, and perhaps not even you need to sequence for three days. Maybe the, the sequences are, you know, so information rich that once you sequence a few key molecules, you have enough information to really make a prediction of, of a prognosis, right? And the cost of all this is probably very low. And if you start multiplexing your samples, the cost is even lower, right? So perhaps with a few reads, you can make predictions in a simple way. So I think that this has a lot of opportunities and, um, and that's why we're also pursuing it. Um, but then this is not yet there, right? So just to also wrap up to the very beginning, right? So what about sperm, right? So, um, okay. So the thing is like the, the the way that sperm kind of goes is that when you have here the epididymis, right? Your sperm, it, it has to mature and, and go up to the color, right? And then that's where the massive fragmentation happens. But then like what, what we have been studying is comparing the information from the epididymis and the, and the formation from the cauda and the sequencing is still ongoing uh, for high fat diet and low fat diet. But I just wanted to share a bit of the preliminary data, right? Because what previous studies have been doing when they were comparing the, let's say immature sperm to mature sperm is that, so here you can see it in a different dimension, right? Is that as the sperm cells mature, what they basically do is, you know, like basically it looks like small RNA. So basically the sperm RNA composition 
is mainly formed of small RNAs, with pi RNAs being dominant in the early stages and tRNA derived fragments being dominant in the later stages. Right? This is what Illumina has told us about what sperm RNA composition is. And of course, I think that the, 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 the part of the reason of this picture is because you know, that if you look into this profile of biolyzer, it looks like completely degraded RNA. So you say, okay, I choose small RNA sequencing as my choice of sequencing because it looks like small RNA, right? But is that really the right choice? Like, because then you will really only get very short RNAs, right? So we did some preliminary runs uh, with nanopore sequencing, right? About what is the composition of sperm RNA? And we get a completely different picture of what Illumina really is telling us, right? So what we find is that there's a lot of ribosomal RNA, there's mRNA, there's snRNA, there's full length tRNAs, not just tRNA derived fragments. And, and basically mm, the opportunities of understanding which are the molecular carriers of intergenerational information is, is very different now that you have a complete different diversity of which RNAs are even present in your sperm. So, so basically, um, I'm still not saying one is right or the other is wrong, but what I'm saying is that the technology that you're choosing to study your samples is really determining what you can see about your samples. So what the picture we see is completely different from this one. So it is important to understand the biases of the technology that you use when you ask specific biological questions. So in the future work, we're still now using all what I have explained to really answer this question. And unfortunately, I don't have the answer yet, um, but I do hope to have it in the next years to come. Um, or at least some insights about how it's working a bit more than what we know right now. So with this, I'd just like to thank uh, the people who actually have done the work. So I'm really happy about all the members of my lab and how they all contributed. They're really a great bunch of people. Um, and also to the funding and to the collaborators and to all of you for, for your attention and your time. And thank you. Okay, we start here, and then I will repeat the question maybe for the audience when they ask. Okay, sure. So, I was um, interested about the uh, multiplexing of samples to get enough material. Um, do you think this could be carried uh, into the single cell level, considering that maybe a single cell has picograms of RNA? And would the model like learn that many barcodes to be able to be multiplex? So the model has learned those barcodes because that we have already done. So the barcoding part was not an issue. So we can now demultiplex 96 barcodes. Uh, a different question is what you exactly pose, right? Like if you really want to bring this to single cell, then you need to also optimize in parallel the library. So this is something that is very tempting. So we have been trying to go in this path. I didn't present anything about that yet. Um, but of course, we're also starting with very simple models, right? Uh, so we're using uh, Synopus oocytes, which are huge cells to start with, right? Um, but then like in principle, this is something that I think could be done in the future if you make your library efficient enough, but then there's still room uh, to, so this path still needs, uh, you know, while of troubleshooting, but it is actually, um, it's actually a project of one of the PhD students. So, so you say that the model would still be able to learn, I don't know, 3,000 barcodes? We haven't tried that. I mean, so far, the 96 was fine, right? But when you typically do single cell, for example, you do a 96 well plate, and then you have a second uh, adapter, which is for the plate, right? So you have, a, a, you know, a well, let's say, barcode, and then the second level is your plate barcode, right? So with 96, you should be fine. You will just need to put a second adapter for each plate. Combine. Yeah, so then you combine the plates, right? Um, I forgot to ask but to to say the yeah. question. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank you. Part. It was really, really interesting. Uh, I was I was so hooked at the first slides about lavarchism that I said, oh wow, this is going to be fun. <laughs> and, and the talk was fun, but in another way. Yeah. Uh, so go, going back to to your last to your last slide about um, about what we, what we lack, or let's say the different tools that. Mm -hmm. uh, Looking, looking the same problem with different tools, we get different answers. Right? Mm -hmm. So, what what do you think you would need in order to? I mean, what what tool would you need more in order to go to your last slide to this to this question? To, to how can we connect the whatever we do in life with whatever happens to the to the sperms and RNA distribution? I mean, so we still don't know, right? I mean, that's a bit what what we're looking into so i mean our hope is that already by 
adding this to the picture, we will maybe have a clearer view or a clearer answer of what is happening, right? Um, another thing is like, is that we're also doing combinations of diets uh, where you then reverse the diet, right? Uh, because we, if something is important and, and is not transmitted, so if you're able to then revert the phenotype, then your molecule of interest should also be reverted. So it's a way to kind of... Questions and answers. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so so yeah, so the, the question kind of was like how how the different, um, if the, adding different technologies would help us understand this picture uh, in a better way. No te contesto, es porque estoy escuchando esto, eh? We can hear you, eh? <laughs> well, maybe that's good. <laughs> I think they muted. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. Sorry, so I lost this thread. <laughs> okay. So going so to, to as like a follow up. So for instance, I was I was just thinking. I mean, the the let's say we we boil down the very to the very basics. Uh, the difference between let's say Darwinism and Armatism is basically the mechanism, right? I mean, at the end you get more or less you can get more or less the same different distributions, but the problem is that what 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 mechanics you have. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking. I mean, do you have any way of dynamically look at these changes in distribution? I mean, I don't know, you have, uh, we know the state of the sperm or in different parts at uh, different times in the lifetime of the of the of the mice that they yep. have to give you different combinatorial uh, yep. food. So do you have ways of, of, of analyzing that? So the, the, the model that we are actually doing is not just comparing high fat and low fat and that's it, right? I mean, we we are doing a longitudinal analysis as well in the sense that like we're doing different diet time points as well as reverting the diets. And we're also sequencing here, I didn't enter into that, but all the stages. Uh, so, so we also have, so we're we're separating these different cells, right? To see where the, 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 the populations are changing, right? So it's, it's a huge data uh, set actually. Um, but then like, until we don't have the final data that we're super happy with the library, we don't want to use that to sequence all the samples. So that's why, like, even though these samples have been collected, uh, we're waiting to do the final tuning of the library because then we will apply it to everything, right? Um, but, but yeah, so I've been in, in trying to figure out not only what, but also when, for example, right? And to understand really then the, the, the mechanism. I'm very confused by this. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, so what happens? I mean, because there is all short RNA and fragmented RNA, which is like, what do you mean? Fragmented, like, are they functional? Or, and is this that this increases and the transcription is shut down, like the, the mRNA transcription or ribosomal RNA? Trans I mean, I mean, you have all this compactation, like all, all the, and the, and the histones are lost, and then they're changed for these protamines, right? When right. the sperm is formed, and so on and so forth, right? So, so in principle, you don't expect to have um, a normal cell that is going to be doing. But then, like, what is happening to the RNA? What we can see just based on this is that there's a massive degradation of the sperm, right? And then there's different questions that you can. So this raises many possibilities, right? But then, like, my point is like the fact that you see fragmented. So I don't think that this is small RNAs, which is what in general people were really thinking. I think that this is just fragmented RNAs, ah, right? Now, fragmented RNA from all RNA, RNA biotypes. Like I didn't show this, but when you look into these, these right, but small RNAs, look at disaster. I mean, it's so completely de degraded, right? Okay, so this is still the main. A lot of it, not ah, okay, all so of so it, so but a lot of it. I mean, if you can also see the tail, right? There's a tail in your distribution. Right. Um, so maybe the interesting is what is not degraded, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And not what is degraded. But then to do that, you need a method that keeps the read length uh, and not just that the first thing that you do in your library prep is I chop everything and then I start sequencing, right? right? Because maybe read length is the most important feature actually determining what is important. So maybe it's not about what is differentially expressed, but what is not degraded, for example, right? And, so, and how you link it with when you do bulk on testes, you find everything expressed. When you do what? When you bulk, do bulk RNA sequencing in testes, every possible gene is expressed. <laughs> well, there's a lot of stuff expressed, like, right? Every, but if that chromatin is open, everything is... Yeah, so you then, have a lot of... um, Yeah. But I mean, not everything, right? But, but I mean... But, uh, like, but yeah. Is the issue with the largest number of genes expressed? Mm -hmm. 
at all. Yeah, so, so testing is very different for, for, for everything, right? We also have many modification enzymes that are only expressed in testes, actually, only in those moments, right? And that if you deplete them, they lead to um, sterility, pointing out that maybe they have a role in all this sperm maturation, actually, right? So all this is what we're trying to tie together. Right? Cool. Cool. Hey, it looks like you have a question from, from the chat. Yeah, I think I, I see here one. I think, uh, oh no, <laughs> it's not a question. But <laughs> I have a methodological question about yes. um, the mapping of uh, long range data. Have you found um, any problems regarding genes mapping to pseudo genes? I mean, trans messenger RNA is mapping to pseudo genes. Okay, so so the, the question, I just I remember to repeat, it, <laughs> is about uh, mappability in, in long read, and if, if, if you have issues mapping long um, mRNAs into pseudogenes. So I would say that um, the longer the, your reads are, the less this will happen, right? I mean, in principle, long reads should, because there's going to be some differences between your pseudogenes and your uh, main gene, right? Or let's say the one that is not a pseudogene. Uh, so in principle, long read sequencing should alleviate more than Illumina these issues, but you still will have issues like that of multi-mapping, right? So you need to probably still figure out a, a, a way to map your reads to avoid these issues, right? So for example, ribosomal RNAs are in multiple copies, right? So for example, I mean, now we will also be sequencing with Illumina these samples, right? For example, were the paper studies not capturing the ribosomal RNAs because they were not reverse transcribing them? or because the mapping was actually discarding all of them because they are multi-mapping, for example, right? So then you were just losing those reads because you only count uniquely mapped reads because that's a very, so, so I mean, if the, if the mapping would be better, I would say, yes, it's gonna be better, but then like, maybe you have to choose to map the transcriptome in your case, if that's what you really care about, right? So maybe if you have, if you're interested in, in some genes that have a lot of pseudogenes, maybe you should not map the genome for those. Maybe you should map a transcriptome. But, but then you will miss other things if you already assume that that's your transcript, right? So, I mean, it really depends on the question you want to, to address. But in general, I would say that long read sequencing improves that problem uh, compared to short read sequencing. Okay, great, thanks. I have a question. Um, you said that you, well, with, with the long reads, you have been able to link some modifications to particular isoforms to a gene. Have you found like something? Some example of interesting stuff that only occurs to one and to two. So we, we do see some examples of that. I mean, right now we're doing the analysis of the data, right? So so we already know that there's um, isoform specific modification examples. Um, and now we're trying to do more an aggregate um, analysis to see, okay, if now we compare, for example, different conditions, then do we see that then these ones, uh, you know, are degraded or are not degraded in the next stage during maturation more than the others and, and so on, right? But this to do transcriptome wide, it, it takes a while, right? But but yeah, there are there are cases of um, M six A specific isoform uh, modifications. Uh, I have a question about the uh, properties, for example, long rate sequencing to uh, study uh, the modification because uh, as I understood, they also have many errors. So to distinguish between errors and modification. Yeah. So um. The question is about how can we distinguish uh, errors and modifications? And the thing is, if you have, so if you have pairwise conditions, these, so this, the base calling, the errors that you refer to are actually systematic as well. So this means that when you compare one condition to the other, you can subtract them to each other. Um, so basically those will not cause a problem because if your data is noisy, they, they will be equally noisy, if that makes sense, right? So if you think about where these errors come from, they usually come from uh, the, let's say a base calling algorithm uh, that has a model that maybe, you know, is not doing well in that specific region. And for example, wherever it has, I'm making it up seven A's, which is a typical example because it struggled with homopolymer regions, it will put always six A's. So it always has a deletion there, right? So, but then this same error will be present in both your samples. So then you can subtract them and then you will see whatever is different between your two samples in terms of errors, which then in general tends to be much more um, true positives of modification changes, right? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, but then once you move to the, the novel base calling, uh, like using a model that is trained with modifications, then you don't care about the errors anymore because you're actually predicting directly the modification in the single read, right? Yes. One is about the plot of the interpretive number. Of the what, sorry? Uh, the what? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. About the plot of the interpretive number is because I don't know if it's about all the stages of the uh, of the sperm or a mean of the all the stages. This one? Yeah. No, the, the left one. This one. So this is so this is a spermatogonium. So the, no, the left. The ring, the ring, the ring. Ah, this is mature sperm. Ah, only mature sperm. Yeah, so it, here spermatogonium is normal. It has normal ring. You know, it has normal ring. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of, and, and, and it decreases as it moves forward. And after this behavior in the oocytes, make the things are oocytes or only? So oocytes are a different story, but then oocytes actually are the opposite. Oocytes look like this, and then they go to this. Yeah. And the composition of well, we did, we haven't done the sequencing yet in detail with with the oocytes because there's other associated issues. Um, but yeah, also oocytes are funky. If that's a long story short. Yeah. Well, so do, do these devices have a duration? Like the nanopore sort of starts after X gigabases starts malfunctioning. Or something like that, like a card. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the question is if devices from Nanopore kind of uh, have uh, die at some point, and probably the long story is yes, but then they just replace it, right? Um, you haven't reached the. I mean, it's just like it will stop working, like any I don't know if your centrifuge stop working, right? I mean, what you change is the flow set. You need flow sets like you would need for Illumina, and then these are, uh, you know, like um, you use a new flow set each time, right? And the device. It's the same, either you have a manion, a grid ion, or a promethion. Uh, and then like, if you would have any issue with the device, then the company will replace the device or fix it or whatever it is, right? I mean, but but basically the, I mean, we have had some issues at some point and then they replaced it for a new one. But sorry, you don't change that, like the memory that contains the nanopores, you don't change it after every experiment, right? That That's changes the... every experiment. All oh, right. So the flow cell has the membrane with the pores, mm -hmm. and that's what is a. It would be like um, yeah, like some like you you put a new one each time, right? So as you sequence, so this is a bio like you know the, the pores are biological pores in reality, right? So and you're putting proteins at thirty seven degrees, which is the sequencing temperature, right, or whatever you know you you choose to put it, but so. As if you would put your proteins at 37, I mean, they're not gonna be very happy usually like for a very long number of hours, right? You put them in the freezer, right? Usually to keep them happy. And and basically like the, the pores start dying, also they will start being clogged. Also then, I mean, why they die, it's, we can argue about different things, right? But basically they will die. The number of pores available uh, dies after a given number of hours. So, so you start sequencing with more pores and then as you sequence, you have less pores. And then yeah, at some exactly. point you say, okay, uh, I stopped the run because I'm not getting more reads because I don't have any more pores. Yeah, uh, well, I think the lane stays and that's what I was asking after X gigabases before we start working. Like you actually change it. So. Yeah, exactly. So the, it's, it's like the sequencing is like it plateaus at some point, right? And then you stop. Um, but then sometimes they, I mean, you can revive them, right, as well. Like you can, because some of the pores die because different reasons. So then you can, for example, put some DNAs to the to the to, to the flow cell, which removes the clogged RNA and DNA, and then you can sequence a bit again. So, yeah. I have another question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. You talk about these RNA modification codes. Like, if if how close are we to get a code? And is each RNA modification doing? something yeah. specific <laughs> what do you think about that yeah how close are we or it yeah so so the question is about the rna modification code i guess like in a similarity to the histone code right and uh, that we now know you know like some histone modifications are open or and some are like we you know for for let's say so i would say that um that we still don't know a lot of the of the code and that because it's so much more diverse in the terms of the and also because in the case of DNA, yes, you have different regions of DNA, right? I mean, some will be enhancers or promoters or whatever, but then like in the case of RNA, 
the universe of modifications is, is, is so uh, dependent on the RNA biotypes that you have, that then you, the story will change depending on your RNA biotype, right? So for example, in mRNAs, yeah, you have a lot of M6A, but then you have other modifications that are much, much less abundant, but then some of them are important. Some of them are important for some processes, but not others. And some of them are important, you know, have this function if it's in a structured region, but not if it's in a non-structured region. So, and then if we go to the tRNAs, the same, right? So, I mean, we know a lot about them, but then I think that the story is not, like, like in the case of DNA, maybe like it's like, is it open or closed kind of, right? And it's more binary if we oversimplify it very much, right? And, but then here really, there's such a diversity of functions. Like, you know, is it, is it trans, maybe it's just for like, you know, for increased stability, or maybe it's just for increased translation, or this one, it causes the relocalization to this region, or this one is just to, act as an identity element in the tRNA so that, you know, another enzyme recognizes it. And then this other one is recognized by the synthetase that then will say, okay, now I have to amino this tRNA. So it, I think that it's, there's many more layers in the case of modifications. And that's why, and, and some of them maybe will not have any function at all beyond the structural, right? Um, but, but yeah, I think that, I don't think it's, it, it's, just, it's, a, it's gonna be like, okay, this list of modifications is for on and this list of modifications is right. for off, right? I think that it's, it's a bit, so I know that sometimes it's like used as a similarity, but then I think it's, it's a bit different. Um, okay. Any other questions? I don't know. How do I see it? Uh, yeah, here. Yeah, I think it's, it's fun. Okay, yeah. Well, then let's thank Eva again. Thank you. Well, should I stop it somehow? Hmm? You have a ticket? Yeah. Nice.